It is difficult to imagine the Philippine educational landscape without the private schools. The private schools help the state fulfill its mandate of making quality education accessible to all Filipinos. It is in recognition of this role that the Fund for Assistance to Private Education, a permanent trust fund for private education, was established through Executive Order 156 on November 5, 1968. The Private Education Assistance Committee, or the PEAC, was created as the trustee of the fund. The PEAC is composed of the Secretary of Education as the ex officio chair and a representative each from the National Economic Development Authority, Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities, and Association of Christian Schools, Colleges, and Universities. For the development of private education, the PEAC takes on the role of funder, advocate, partner, and enabler. A national secretariat headed by an executive director executes the policies, programs, and initiatives of the PEAC for private education. In 1989, a landmark piece of legislation, RA 6728, or the Government Assistance to Students and Teachers in Private Education, or GASPE, was passed. The GASPE Act, which was amended by RA 8545 in 1998, institutionalized government assistance to private education in the country. The Educational Service Contracting, or ESC, Teacher Salary Subsidy, or TSS, Senior High School Voucher Program, the in-service training, or INSET, and research are part of the Department of Education's GASPE program. The PEAC implements the GASPE program given the track record of the PEAC in program management. The PEAC has been involved in the development of the ESC from piloting a scheme, which was a precursor to the ESC in 1982 to 1986, to implementing the ESC in 1986 to 1991, and from 1996 up to the present. The ESC today has close to a million beneficiaries. Part of the PEAC infrastructure for the GASPER program is the Regional Secretariat. The PEACRS is headed by the Regional Program Director who designates a Regional Program Coordinator for the day-to-day -day program implementation in the region. The PEAC has the following responsibilities in the GASPER program. Orientation, ESC certification, SHS voucher applications, processing, monitoring, resolving cases of schools with adverse findings, regular meetings and consultations with stakeholders, research and data gathering, in-service training. The PEAC is also accredited as a local continuing professional development or CPD provider by the Professional Regulation Commission or PRC. Participants of the INSET programs offered by the PEAC have the opportunity to earn the required CPD units for the renewal of their professional licenses. From 2012 to 2017, the PEAC trained a total of more than 70,000 junior high school teachers and since 2016, an estimated 17,000 SHS teachers. The PEAC also implements its own programs of assistance. The Assistance to Programs and Initiatives to Reform Education, or ASPIRE, gave funding support in the amount of $33.7 million to 99 projects of private educational associations since 2015 to 2016. The research for school improvement towards excellence has assisted 79 private school administrators and teachers writing their theses and dissertation since 2015 to 2016. The Dissemination Assistance to Research and Education, or DARE, has supported 16 faculty members who presented their papers in international conferences abroad since it was launched in 2016 to 2017. The Philippine Education Research Journal is an online resource for decision makers, policy makers, and practitioners in education. 
its editorial board consists of highly respected educators and researchers. The Philippine Education Conference is an opportunity for school administrators and teachers to learn from educational leaders and experts here and abroad as they discuss educational issues, concerns, trends, and innovations. Recognizing the inherent strengths of the private schools in achieving excellence in Philippine education, the PEAC is committed to promoting private education as an integral part of our educational system. Good day, everyone. I am May Malanta, the Training and Development Associate of the Private Education Assistance Committee National Secretariat. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar for English on streamlining the K-12 curriculum, an approach to determining which standards and competencies to teach. This program is part of the pre-opening activities and interventions of the PEAC to assist private schools in their recovery and readiness of operations for school year 2020-2021 amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Before I introduce today's speaker, may I just inform everyone that the handouts, the soft copy of the handouts for this webinar will be uploaded in the PAC website after all the 10 webinars are done. Our speaker this afternoon is an English teacher of the an English trainer of the PAC for junior high school in Zen. He obtained his master's degree in education from LaSalle University in Osama City. He was the former vice principal for academics at LaSalle Academy in Ligan and has presented and published his research works in international research conferences for languages and social sciences. Currently, he is the assistant principal of St. Benedict Childhood Education Center in Cebu City. Dear teachers, our speaker this afternoon, Mr. John Ryan F. Caliego. Thank you, Ms. Mayi. And hello to all the teachers in the country who are watching right now. So I will be sharing my screen now. So once again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar sponsored by PAAC. So today, our session will focus on how to streamline the K-12 curriculum. So this is an approach in determining which K-12 standards and competencies in English are we going to teach. So in the context for today's webinar, we will be using the curriculum guide for the English uh, in 2016, and we will also be using the MELCs that was uh, released by DepEd um, a month ago. So to start this webinar, let's have these reminders. First, you take notes. So there are a lot of information that will be given today, and so it's important for English teachers to take notes. Second, you ask questions after the talk. So there could be questions or clarification that you want to, to be addressed. Number three is you download the handout after the talk. And number four, please view the slide presentation of the speaker in full screen on your devices to better appreciate the content. So this webinar is actually developed or actually um, given to the teachers because of this premise, okay? So we know that the pandemic has challenged all of us, especially the educational system in the country. And so there's a central question that we will be answering at the end of this webinar. And that central question says, how will schools in the new normal be able to cover the K-12 curriculum? We know that the number of days um, in our teaching is now limited because of this pandemic 
And the academic calendar given by DepEd is also limiting us to be able to um, address perhaps the curriculum. So this webinar will actually answer that question. How are we going to prepare our schools in the new normal so that we can deliver the K-12 curriculum? So for us to be guided, we have these objectives for today. So for us to be able to prepare, we will discuss first the rationale and parts of the Dep Ed Smelks curriculum guide for the school year 2020 and 2021. Second, we will also explain the process of streamlining the K-12 standards and competencies. We will be defining what streamlining is and this will help us prepare these documents. Number three is relate the importance of alignment and streamlining with PAC recertification. And number four is we are going to apply the process, whatever is discussed today, to select selected units of study in a subject area for curriculum mapping, identification of instructional materials, and preparation of the unit calendar. We all know just recently that there is an advisory released that private schools in the country opening in June must get the IATF okay. What does it mean? It means that the schools must comply with the necessary requirements to meet the minimum health standards. And there is no face-to-face -face as what was declared by the president and that ends so in the light of the directives of IATF and the DepEds, what do private schools in the Philippines need to do in order to be ready for school year 2020-2021? So let's try to see or to look closer to the document released by DepEd, which is the DepEd Order 7 series of 2020. So what are the requirements for private schools that um, would like to open despite this pandemic. Number one is that they're going to submit the following things. The school's plan for compliance with minimum, st minimum health standards. Number two, they're going to submit the school's learning continuity plan. And number three, the school will submit the academic school calendar for school year 2020 and 2021. So just recently, this advisory was released by DepEd. And so what else can private schools prepare? Because uh, aside from DepEd, we, we also have, especially the schools, uh, ESC participating private schools, we are also under PAAC. So by learning, the, by learning from DepEd these requirements, PAAC has also released some requirements for the private schools especially on the matter of certification. So schools that are due for certification must submit the requirements on September 1 to 30, 2020, and part of the requirements is the curriculum map. So this will help the schools prepare for the e-recertification this school year, and that will start on November 2020 until March 2021. Therefore, Given this, for schools that are due for, for certification this year, this webinar is really a great help for you because today we are going to present some samples and the process of doing these documents. So these are the specific documents that are needed to be submitted. First, you are going to prepare the PAAC School Recovery and Readiness Plan and this is in line with DepEd Learning Continuity Plan. So whatever you prepare for this document can also be submitted to DepEd for the Learning Continuity Plan. Second is the PAC School Recovery and Readiness Assessment Tool Results. And with this too, you are going to attach the PAC Certification Assessment Instrument, Self-Ratings and Evidences of Compliance. Now, given these requirements that we can prepare among the private schools in the Philippines, the center of these documents is actually requiring schools to prepare their curriculum. But the question there is, how will our schools in the new normal, 
especially the ESC schools, can prepare the school curriculum. Because we are challenged this time with this pandemic, how are we going to prepare our curriculum now? So I have here a sample curriculum map. So this is the basic format for the curriculum map. And this is called the diary curriculum map because it contains different elements, important elements. We have here, the in the first column, we have here the, the month or the budget of time. And we have the unit content. And across that, we have different elements that can be found from the curriculum guide released by DepEd in 2016 and also the MELCs. And we have also the assessments, activities, and resources, and also the institutional core values. With this curriculum map, our question now is, how am I going to prepare this? How am I going to come up with a diary curriculum map that the certifiers in PAC are also looking for? How can our schools prepare our curriculum using the process of doing this curriculum map? And how are we going to prepare this so that we will comply with the e-recertification if our school is due for that? So before we proceed to the main content of this webinar, let us remember first that the context of this is actually what is happening right now. So the school in the new normal is actually giving us this situation. First, there is a shortened school, school calendar. So by saying shortened school calendar, we cannot expect that the number of days that were allotted before when we were teaching is the same thing that will happen for this school year. And because of that, because there is a shortened number of school days, um, there could be a challenge for the teachers to look for varied instruction modalities. So some, some schools might opt for face, um, online face-to-face -face or synchronous. Others might opt for uh, blended learning. And so because of that, there is now a very limited face-to-face -face contact with st students. And just currently, DepEd has announced that there is no face-to-face -face that's happening unless the vaccine can be produced. And number four is there's reduced class time. And number five is there is there's, uh, frequent disruption that we experience every day. So given this, given these situations or scenarios, it can be concluded that teaching time is really affected for us teachers. So one concern now among teachers is that how are we going to deliver the curriculum given the short and disruptive time in teaching compared to the regular calendar we had before, this health crisis actually came in. So these are the important things that we need to consider to be able to continue delivering this curriculum despite this pandemic. Number one is what you see on your left in the screen. We will be using the DepEd curriculum guide, the version in 2016. And we will also be looking at the DepEd, the DepEd MELCS matrix and for ESC participating private schools, we will be using we will be using the PAC certification assessment instrument as our guide, okay, in making sure that all the elements required in the certification are also present in our curriculum. So let's begin by looking at the newest release MELCs, because that is the the, the concern of teachers now. According to this document, in the MELCs guidelines on page two, releasing the MELCs does not downplay the standards set by the K-12 curriculum guide. Rather, these serve as guide to teachers as they address the instructional needs of learners while ensuring that curriculum standards are maintained and achieved. Therefore, if we look at this document, we can say that MELCs does not replace the DepEd's K-12 curriculum guide, but it will support the K-12 curriculum guide. Further, we can actually find in the Filipino briefer on page 33, it was explained further, quote, and I quote, 
Pagtandaan na ang layunin ng pagbuo ng MELCS ay hindi upang palitan ang kasalukuyang curriculum guide, kundi hinihikayat pa rin ang mga guro na sumangguni sa curriculum guide ng Pilipino o ng ibang mga subjects kung sa tingin nila ay hindi sapat ang competency tinutukoy sa MELCS. Therefore, the use of the MELCS fellow teachers is not prescriptive. Again, it's not prescriptive. But according to these documents, it is suggestive. You are just, they are just suggesting to teachers and teachers have this freedom to be able to unpack these and make use of, the, make use of the, these in their designs. So if you think that the K-12 curriculum guide is still needed, then you can use that or the MELCs. However, we need to consider based on these documents that MELCs could just only be a temporary arrangement. What do you mean by temporary arrangement? So this is now what I was saying earlier. This temporary arrangement means that whatever we do with the use of the MELCs will probably still go back to the full use of the DepEd's K-12 curriculum guide. Therefore, we need to balance fellow teachers, the ones existing in the curriculum guide and the ones that are found in the MELCs. So how are we going to do that when we say balancing these two? Let's try to see how is this balance between the old curriculum guide and the MELCs are actually supported by the PAC certification assess assessment instrument. As what you can see here in the standards of compliance under uh, curriculum and instruction, PAC says that for a curriculum map to be effective, this curriculum map must be aligned with the philosophy, vision, mission, goals, and objectives, must be aligned with the K-12 curriculum guides, standards, and competencies. Again, must be aligned with the curriculum guides, standards, and competencies. So there you have, there you, there you have it, fellow teachers. There is that guideline that we still have to align the curriculum guide standards and competencies that are found in the MELCs, okay? The one that I mentioned earlier, and so on and so forth. So if you can see in this document, it's not just about completing the curriculum map, but it's also ensuring alignment as the word align keeps repeating. So the question now, if we will be using this curriculum map, the question now here is that, how can our ESC schools prepare a curriculum map that covers the K-12 standards and competencies in the new normal and meets recertification requirements as what was mentioned earlier? The answer to this is we can prepare by using the DepEd curriculum guide. That's the, that's the first one. The second one is we can make the DepEd MELCs as our reference. That's the number two. And we can consider the PAC certification assessment instrument as our reference in looking at those guidelines mentioned there. So this is now the format of the diary curriculum map. So let's try to look closer at how it is done and what are the contents of this curriculum map. So if you see here in the next part, you can see that the three columns here are actually taken from the DepEd curriculum guide. What are these? These are the unit content, the content standards, and the performance standards. Now, there might be questions here that in the MELCs, especially in English, there are no longer um, content and performance standards found. So what will I do? I have to get them from the DepEd curriculum guide because as what was mentioned in our PAC certification assessment instrument, we should always be aligning these competencies to our standards. So we should not forget that even if MELCs has only used for English subject, the grade level standards, we should not forget that there are specific content and performance standards that are found in the curriculum guide. The second part of this is actually the competencies or the, the skills, okay? So where can I find this in the, in the list? So I can get it 
from the DepEd, DepEd curriculum guides and or the DepEd MELCs. Then what about the next three columns? The next three columns is actually found or it's, it, it's actually taken from the teachers who are designing the curriculum map. So these are from the subject teachers. What are they? These are the assessments, activities, and resources. And finally, the last one to complete our curriculum map is the school's vision and mission or the school's institutional core values. So in the next part of this webinar, we are going to walk through the process of completing the different parts. We are going to, to discuss with you the process of completing this and assuring that there is alignment in all of these elements. Because again, in PAC, as what we always repeat in our inset, we are going to complete the curriculum map. And aside from completing it, we are going to ensure alignment. But if you look at the certification instrument of PAC, it's not just also required no, in depth ed that we are going to align the competencies to the standards. It's also actually found in the standard of compliance under the curriculum and instruction of the PAC certification instrument. If you see here, the word alignment or align is repeated many times. And that suggests that as we prepare our curriculum map, English teachers or teachers in the private schools in general should be able to ensure alignment above the other requirements, okay? So how are we going to do that? If we go back to the PAC part by part, the components will tell us that we can actually do processes, step by step process. We have here step one or the part one of the curriculum map. And we have here an explanation from the MELCs in the science brief for page 42, explaining how important it is to always go back to the standards. So according to this document, it says here, the K-12 basic education curriculum is standards-based. So if it is standards-based, we cannot get away from the use of content standards and performance standards. So just a review, we've been discussing this in our inset before in PAAC. These content standards cover a, a specified scope and sec of sequential topics, while these performance standards describe the abilities of the learners that are expected to the, that are expected to be demonstrated in relation to the content standards. And this is further explained, okay? This is further explained in the MELC's guidelines about what is the connection between the competencies found in the MELCs and also the content to the content and performance standards. According to the guidelines in MELCs on page three, the content and performance standards are directly lifted from the curriculum guides. Its inclusion is to emphasize that the identification of MELCs is anchored on the prescribed standards and not a departure from the standards-based basic education curriculum. Therefore, based on that idea, we can say that teachers are still encouraged to refer back to the 2000 curriculum guide of DepEd in unpacking the MELCs, in determining which of the competencies found in the MELCs needs help in or from the old curriculum guide. So what are the important points to be remembered here, English teachers? Number one, we have to treat the competencies that are always linked back to the standards. We cannot teach these competencies separately from the standard or take away the standards and just use the competencies. Because we always ask ourselves, English teachers, when we unpack these documents, we always ask ourselves, what is the connection of these competencies to the standards found in the curriculum guide? Number two is, there is an explicit mention in this briefer or in this guideline from the MELCs that as teachers, we have to learn and understand that when, or that, that when we 
read the briefer, the word unpacking is always repeated. And what does it mean when DepEd repeats the word unpacking? There may be cases that the competencies found in the MELCs are not sufficient. And we understand that. Because when we viewed in the English curriculum, before when we had some comments that there are too many competencies in English across domains, we now realize in the MELCs that from those domains competencies, they are now deleted and only few are left. And so we could also, we could also discover in the MELCs now that how am I going to teach all of this given this quarter? Because I only have, for example, four uh, most essential competencies in the MELCs. Are these sufficient? Is it enough for me to cover the, for me to, to cover the entire standards? Thus, we need to go back to the 2016 K-12 curriculum guide if we think that it's not sufficient because that is a form of reference to other sub-competencies in order to achieve the standards. So our choices, you have to remember this, English teachers, our choices of the competencies that are taken from the MELCs and are also connected to, this, to the competencies in the K-12 standards would always be guided by the content and performance standards. So later on, you will also discover that this will also put emphasis on the use of the performance standard. And that content standard is there for the purpose or for this, uh, at the service or at the attainment of the performance standard. So let's now proceed to our step number two or our part two of the curriculum guide. In this example, you can see that the list of competencies that you are going to put under this column can be taken from the DepEd curriculum guide in 2016 and or. That means it can be combined or it can be taken either of the two or either from the two um, using the DepEd MELCs. So this is the part. I would like to emphasize this to you, English teachers. This is the part where it takes a lot of thinking, time, and process for English teachers. Because this is the time when we are going to think of competencies, and the competencies represent the standards. So whatever we choose among these competencies would always affect the way we deliver and ask students to develop or to learn these standards. So this is, this is the time when it takes a lot of thinking process. So where are we going to get the list of requirements to be placed in this part of the curriculum map? We are going to get them from the curriculum guide or from the curriculum uh, or from the DepEd MELCs, or you can use both, okay? So it's not always taken from the DepEd curriculum guide or you have the choice to also limit yourselves to using MELCs, but you can actually use both. So let's try to see further in this science briefer a support to that claim that we can actually use both. These learning standards are further represented as learning competencies. See, they are represented by the learning competencies. Therefore, we can say that there is always alignment between the standards, the competencies, and the activities because these competencies that they are going to choose from the list in the curriculum guide and MELCs will be used by the teacher in designing the lessons, uh, the activities, and the assessments. So you will be ensured alignment once you are going to follow that process. So in turn, standards determine the competencies and the competencies determine the activities. Thus, our choices of the activities must develop the competencies and the development of these competencies, English teachers, will in turn become the steps in developing or achieving the standards. So because of that, let's go back to the characteristics of the essential learning competencies as mentioned in the guidelines in MELCs page 2, and these essential competencies are found in the curriculum guide. So according to this, learning competency is essential if number one, it is aligned with national state and local standards. It connects the content to higher concept across content areas. It is applicable to real life situations. 
if students left school after this grade, it would be important for them to have this competence above many others. And number five, it wouldn't be expected that most students would learn this from their parents or communities if not taught at school. So if these are the criteria to determine if the competencies are essential, what do you think are the criteria or is the main criterion in making the MELCs? Because this is, these are the criteria that determines the essential competencies in the 2016 version. What about now the criteria that determines the MELCs? So let's try to see this document from DepEd. So these are from the guidelines in the MELCs. As the department anticipate, anticipates the challenges in employing various teams in the delivery of the learning standard due to COVID-19, the number of the identified essential learning competencies per quarter were further reduced, thus the term most essential learning competencies are found. So what do you mean by it's reduced? You can observe, especially in English, it's, it's the most affected subject area, that from 14,171 learning competencies across subject areas, it's now reduced to 5,689 learning competencies. And take note, teachers, that that is 40% of the total learning competencies that are found in the 2016 version. So what criterion was actually used by DepEd to determine those MELCs? So in determining the most essential learning competencies, the department collaborated with stakeholders from the Assessment Curriculum and Technology Research Center that during which the descriptor, which is endurance, was considered the primary determining factor. Again, what is the main criterion? Very good. That is endurance. So what do you mean by endurance? We discussed this in our previous insets in PAAC. We found out in our previous trainings that endurance could also mean a learning competency can remain with learners long after a test or unit of study uh, which is completed in school or if it is useful beyond a single test or unit of study. That means that whatever we teach in the school or in the classroom can be used by the students in the future when they get their own jobs or when they get old. For example, of these learning competencies that are considered most essential and enduring are this. We have the research skills, the reading comprehension, the writing, map, map reading, and hypothesis testing, and these are considered essential in many professions and in everyday life. So given this criterion, are there still other criteria that we can use as English teachers in determining which of the competencies found in the old curriculum guide and in the MELCs um, can be used for us to unpack further? So this is a document from TEPSA News which you can actually download from this link here. This is, um, this is an article that gives us four criteria, not just one, but four criteria in streamlining or prioritizing standards. And that is the use of real method or real criteria. So what are these real criteria? So we have the first one, the R. R stands for readiness. E stands for endurance, which was used by DepEd. And number three, we have A, which is assessment. And number four is L, or leverage. So among these four, DepEd used endurance as the criterion that identifies the MELCs. Now, are we going to expand this? Are we going to use R, A, and L? That will be discussed later on in this webinar. So let's go back to our diary curriculum map. In this part, it's now clear to us that we will get from the DepEd curriculum guide and or the DepEd MELCs 
based on the real method or real criteria. So the competencies here will always be linked back and will always be connected to the real criteria or in DepEd's document connected to endurance. And when we say endurance, what does it mean? It is transferred or the competency can be transferred to real life, which means that the learning competency can still be used even after students graduate from, from college or high school and can be used to any professionals and can be used in everyday life. So let's now take a closer look at this document in PAAC on how it supports the endurance part, no? how it supports the transfer of learning to real life. Based on this document, you can see here that in the PAAC certification assessment instrument, when teachers come up with a learning plan, they are actually guided by this guideline here that says, prepare the learning plans with a systematic and progressive development of student skills resulting to understanding and culminating to transfer learning in real life. So DepEd and PAAC have actually the same intention. They have actually the same purpose of releasing these requirements for us teachers to be guided in make it, making sure that the way we unpack these competencies are actually directed towards alignment of these competencies to the standards, especially the performance standards. So teachers, let us remember that our learning plans are based on the curriculum maps and the competencies in the curriculum map should be the same competencies found in the learning plans. That will ensure alignment. So let's now answer this question. Since transfer of learning to real life is emphasized in MELCs, how do we ensure its achievement in the curriculum guide? If we are always looking at endurance or transfer of learning to real, real life, how are we going to put that in in our curriculum design? So for us to begin answering that, let's go back to the briefer used by DepEd and the MELCs document. If you read the briefer, it always mentions the word unpack as what we actually do in our PAC inset trainings for the past years. And by unpacking, we have these seven techniques that we can do for us to be able to ensure ourselves that we are directed towards endurance or transfer of learning. So the first technique here is unpack into sub-competencies or tasks. Number two is repeat in another unit or grade level. Number three is follow up in higher grade levels. Number four is you cluster with other competencies that are found in the old curriculum guide. The number five is you merge with other competencies and after you rephrase. The number six is you focus on skill rather than on content. And number seven is you align with unit performance standards. Let's begin with the first technique. So what is the first technique? The first technique is we are going to unpack the MELCs into sub-competencies. Now, why are we doing that? If you look at the example for grade 7 alone in quarter 4, there, is only, there, are, there are only few competencies left in the MELCs. For example, if we take out this first competency, employ a variety of strategies for effective interpersonal co communication, like interview, dialogue, and conversation. What do you mean by this in connection to the grade level standards? Am I going to directly teach this to the students? When I meet my students on the first week in quarter four, am I going to let them employ directly a variety of strategies? Because maybe I'm thinking, that I will only be using the MELCs, no? So if that happens, are there, are, are there other competencies that I, that I need as English teachers for me to be able to allow students to develop this competency? 
So I have to go back to the old curriculum guide for me to look for sub-competencies that are connected to this main or most essential learning competencies or competencies. So what are these? We can have determine the tone and mood of the speaker, use different listening strategies based on purpose, topic, and levels of difficulty, determine the intention of speakers by focusing on the unique verbal and nonverbal um, cues, and so on and so forth. So if you look at it, these competencies, these sub-competencies that are found in the old curriculum guide are subsumed by the MELCs. What do you mean by subsumed? They are actually used that they are actually used to guide teachers that will back up the main and the most relevant competency in connection to the standards. Let's have another example. For example, in grade five, quarter three, the main competency there or the most essential learning competency there is summarize various text types based on elements. Am I going to directly ask students to summarize in my classroom the different text types? Of course not. Your students might be shocked when they face you online or having this blended learning. Your students will be shocked, will be overwhelmed that on your first meeting in quarter three, you are going to summarize already various text types. So what you can do is unpack the MILFs, this competency, and look for the sub-competencies in line with the standards that are found in the old curriculum guide. So are we clear with step number one? Very good. Let's proceed to step number two. So step number two is you re there are MELC's competencies that are repeated in another level for reinforcement. And this is not just common in the MELC's. This is also very common in the old curriculum guide. So I have here an example in grade four. Use context clues to find meaning of unfamiliar words like definition, exemplification. And this competency is actually repeated in grade five, and that's found in the MELCs too. Infer the meaning of unfamiliar words using context clues. So what does it suggest? It suggests that these competencies might already be taught in another grade level. So when I unpack the competencies, I have an idea which competencies can I already prioritize in my grade level? And another example in grade seven, determine the worth of ideas mentioned in the text listened to, determine the truthfulness and accuracy of the material viewed, and these competencies are repeated in grade nine in the MELCs. So this step or this technique gives us that confidence that when we review the curriculum guide and the MELCs, we can actually find competencies that are repeated. And by saying repeated, we can actually use them to unpack further the MELCs, to prioritize further the competencies that are connected to the standards. So we have step number three now. Follow up MELCs in higher grade levels. In our INSET, PAC INSET training, especially in the advanced track, if you remember, we discussed there the learning progression. And also we uh, actually gave this to the regular track uh, participants. This learning progression is similar to step or technique number three. What do you mean by learning progression? It means that the competencies are very necessary because they develop further or they progress further in the next grade levels. So it is non-negotiable that you are going to teach it in your grade level because it can be used in another grade level. So for example, in English, in grade seven, the competency related to a text is the verb summarizing or summarize. So students are expected to summarize key information from a text. So by doing that, students are going to read and just summarize. But if you look at grade eight, the competency related to texts, okay, it's not just about summarizing. But in grade eight, it evolves further. 
it progresses. So students do not just summarize, but they are going to recognize positive and negative messages that are conveyed in the text. And if you if you look at that, if you look at that, it is not just the content that progresses, but it's actually the skill. Okay? It's not just about summarizing, but it's already giving judgment whether it has a positive or a negative message that's conveyed in the text. And so in grade nine, it becomes complicated. Okay? So what makes it complicated? Students using the text will not just summarize and will not just recognize, but they are going to make connections. And by, go, by looking at connections, ladies and gentlemen, or fellow teachers, in making connections, students are going to come up with their own generalizations. Students are going to come up with their own conclusions on how these texts that they read are actually related to social issues, concerns, or dispositions in real life. And in grade 10, it's now becoming more complicated. Students do not just summarize, recognize, make connections, but they are going to make a critic of a literary selection or a text based on the different approaches specified in the curriculum guide. So in this example, in this technique, what does it tell us? It tells us that when we unpack the milks, we can easily unpack if we are, remem we are reminding ourselves what are these competencies that are progressing so that I can easily take that as one of, my, as one of the competencies in my list? Number four, cluster with other competencies. So what do you mean by cluster? When we say cluster, it's about combining them together because they show similarities or they show connections. So for example, if we have to look at the curriculum guide, for example, in grade nine, quarter three, identify the distinguishing features of Anglo-American, uh, Anglo-American one a place, reflect on the ideas of the speaker, get familiar with the technical vocabulary for drama and theater. These competencies in the old curriculum guide are actually clustered and rephrased to determine the most essential learning competency. And that is determine the tone, the mood, the technique, and purpose of the author. Okay? So, now let's proceed to number five. So, aside from clustering, we can also make use of this technique when it allows us teachers to merge with other competencies and rephrase. What is, this, what is the criterion for merging? You can only merge the competencies when they show connections and when they show similarities in terms of the skills and the content that are required. So you can also rephrase competencies when you, you want to specify further or you want to be more specific with your competency. So for example, provide words or expressions appropriate for a given situation. These words or expressions are specified in the MELCs as vocabulary or jargons. And this appropriate for a given situation is rephrased into communicative style in the, the, in the identified most essential learning competency. So what is now the identified most essential learning competency? The rephrased one. Determine the vocabulary or jargons expected of a communicative style. So what about the merging and rephrasing? So we have these two learning competencies in the old curriculum guide that are merged and rephrased into this. Employ the appropriate communicative styles for various situations like intimate, casual, conversational, consult consultative, and frozen. So if we learn this technique, we are guided as English teachers which of these competencies can be prioritized in our list. Let's proceed to number six. So number six is focusing on skill rather than content. There are competencies in English 
that focuses on content rather than skill. So in this technique, it suggests that when we unpack the MELKs, we can look for the skills, prioritize the skills rather than the content. One example of that is this. Overall arti artistic value of the structure and elements of the selection. If this is the content required in quarter three for grade 10, how can we focus on the skill? So let's try to look at the verb that's rephrased in the MELKs. So the ov overall artistic value is now focused on composing an independent critique of a selection and also cri critique a literary selection based on the following approaches. So if this is now the case, teachers, English teachers can actually focus on skills rather than the content. And what is that, how is that helping us? If we, if we focus on skills, we can actually and easily connect it to the performance standard because the performance standards contain the task or the verb or the skill that is required. Now we have our technique number seven. In technique number seven, it says they're aligned with unit performance standards. Now, it, align with the unit performance standards. The English teachers will have question on this for sure. Because in the context of the English MELKs, the content and performance standards are no longer present, but it's replaced by the grade level standards. The question of the English teachers here is that, what is the alignment of these competencies to the grade level standards? Are the competencies found in the MELKs for English directed towards the achievement of the goal of the endurance or the transfer of learning to real life since the performance standard is already deleted? So for us to answer that, let's try to look at further on these competencies. So if you look at the content or the grade level standard, there are question marks because that suggests if the competencies are directly aligned to these standards or do we need other competencies or do we need standards for us to be able to say that these are really connected. So are they aligned with the standards? If the grade level standard requires students to demonstrate communicative competence, does the list of competencies allow students in grade seven to do that? So for 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 you for, for you to be able to or for you to be able to answer that, you have to understand that these competencies as in the MELKs, or aside from these competencies in the MELKs, you have to unpack further because that would assure you that the competencies in the MELKs are really connected to the standards. Will this alignment here, the one that I'm showing now, will this alignment lead to endurance or transfer? So how many of these co competencies in the MELKs are actually aligned to the endurance or transfer of learning? So for example, in grade seven, their performance task is about communicative competence, delivering speeches or writing speeches, are these competencies found in the MELKs actually are enough for students to be able to write or deliver speeches? So let's now summarize all of those documents and techniques. And when we do that, we are able to find out that there are gaps. Okay, there are gaps in the way we look at the curriculum guide and also the MELKs. So given these gaps, how do we align standards and competencies to ensure transfer to real life or enduring for lifelong learning? And what process can be done? So that process that I'm talking about is part of the second part of this webinar. So what is the second part of the webinar? This is about streamlining the teaching and learning of the K-12 curriculum. Because there are gaps that we found out, let's try to bridge the gap. Again, uh, let's try to bridge the gaps 
by doing this process. And that process is called streamlining. So what do you mean by streamlining? In this image you see on your screen, you can see a body of water flowing into one or same direction. The flow of the water, if you notice, teachers, is represented by the, line, the lines it created. So there are lines like, like this. There are straight lines that are created. These straight lines create a particular pattern of flow. And that flow is going to one direction. It produces, this one produces streamlines. And streamlines is actually an engineering feat. This is work of the engineers. So just like that, streamlining is a path traced by a massless particle moving with a flow. Or the, the flow follows a particular direction. So given this definition, and just like the engineers that, that, use this, uh, that use the streamlines, we can also use this on the way we design our curriculum. We can actually tell whether our flow in the design is a laminar flow or a turbulent flow. So what do you mean by laminar flow? The fluid particles follow smooth path in layers, or these layers are also called laminae, with each layer moving parallel to each other without mixing. So if you see on the screen, the lines are straightly directed towards one direction, okay? While the, on the other hand, the opposite of laminar flow is a turbulent flow. So what do you mean by turbulent flow? The fluid particles move in raft path and there are cross currents and mixing of layers or laminae and has swirling zones. So if you look at the, the example here, you can see that the arrows are, there are curves, there are, uh, there are layers that are mixed. It can go back and forth. So it's not really that organized. So in our design, in the way we design our own curriculum maps, we English teachers can actually design a laminar flow or a turbulent flow. It depends on the way you do the unpacking. Okay, so let's begin with this example. Is this example using the English curriculum guide, is the flow complicated or is the flow organized? Similarly, is this flow in the old curriculum guide for English, is this turbulent or is this a laminar flow? Correct. This shows a laminar flow because if you are an English teacher using the old curriculum guide, you cannot determine the specific flow in this example. You can start anywhere, then go back, then start somewhere else, and in this kind of flow, it does not help us achieve the goal of transferring because we don't know the direction of our design. But can we transform this flow, this turbulent flow, into a laminar flow? The answer is yes. How are we going to do that? We can make that turbulent flow into a laminar flow by coming up with a curriculum map that shows alignment from the standards, competencies, assessments, activities, resources, and core values. That means that as represented by arrows, we take out those important standards and competencies from the curriculum guide that shows turbulent flow and put them in our curriculum map unpack them and put them in our curriculum map and place our activities, assessments, resources, and core values aligned to these unpacked standards and competencies. At the end of the day, we can say, English teachers, that from the turbulent design we found in the curriculum guides and the maps, we can actually produce this laminar flow. 
So what what uh, what do you mean by streamlining the, uh, the the process that we are doing now? Streamlining is not simply reducing the competencies. I would like you to remember that. Streamlining is not about simply reducing the competencies, but it is establishing alignment between standards, competencies, activities, and resources. That means that we do not just lessen the number of competencies. That's not our main target here, English teachers. We should not just, for example, ah, the milks are there, so I am just going to use the milks. In a way, DepEd says that you can use the MELPs and also PAAC. Now, the question there is, are the competencies in the list enough for me to deliver the K-12 curriculum? If not, then the streamlining means you are aligning these competencies. And by saying aligning, you are making sure that the list of the competencies in the MELCs are also supported by the competencies and standards found in the curriculum guide. So what are the benefits of streamlining? First is it gives clarity of process. Number two is it has efficiency or it produces efficiency in teaching because you can determine and prioritize competencies directly related to the performance standard. Number three is it has focus on skill rather than content. Why skill? Because skills are directly connected to the performance task. And number four, scaffolded skills development. So that's connected to number three. When you focus on skills, you know how these skills progress and are developed further. How are these skills scaffolded so that students are prepared to make the performance task? And number five is it shows evidence of learning. These benefits are actually supported by the way PAC requires schools in their curriculum maps as seen in the certification assessment instrument. By, the, by, by looking at the word alignment, we can further say that DepEd and PAC are in one in allowing or asking teachers to further unpack the curriculum guides and the MELCs so that everything will be connected. Okay, now let's have this example. Let's go back to this example. This is grade six, grade six from quarter one to quarter three. Is this design, is this kind of design we have in our screen right now, do we produce a laminar flow or a turbulent flow? If you look at this example, there are arrows pointed to specific competencies and connected to or pointed to the grade level standards. Are these competencies directly connected to the grade level standards? Or are these competencies sufficient for the students to achieve the standard? What about these in grade seven? These are the list of competencies that are found in the MELCs. Are these competencies showing us a laminar flow or a turbulent flow in connection to the grade level standards? So for us to be able to achieve our goal, which is to streamline, let's have these two techniques. So what are the two techniques of streamlining? The first technique is about aligning the content standard and competencies with the performance standard. The second one, or the second technique, is identifying power and supporting competencies and clustering them. For those participants in the previous PAAC trainings, these two are not, not anymore new to you because in the PAAC inset before, we have been repeating these techniques for us to be able to unpack. But let's try to discuss this further in the context of streamlining. So let's have the first technique. 
The first technique is aligning the content standard and competencies with the performance standard. What is the main criterion for us to align the content standard to the performance standard? What's the main criterion for us to say that our competencies are aligned to the performance standard? So let's go back to the MELC's guidelines. According to the MELC's guidelines, the main criterion for us to say that these competencies are directly linked to the performance standard is actually looking at the skills that are produced. And these skills should possess the endurance value. We ask ourselves, does this competency allow, allowing, allow students rather to endure in the future? Does this allow students to, to survive in the future? Even if after they graduate, or even if they get their own families, or they have their own families, or when they get, get old, okay? So when we say endurance, it is directly connected to the performance standard because endurance says that it's transfer of learning to real life situations. And that transfer of learning is also found in our performance standard. So this is now technique A diagram. So this diagram will help us English teachers to see the bird's eye view of our unpacking for us to see directly if all the elements found in the steps are actually connected. So how are we going to connect the content standard, the competencies to the performance standard? This unpacking diagram allows us to see the transfer is placed on top of all or of all objects in the diagram. Why do you think transfer is placed on top of the standard or the standards, the content standards? Why is the performance standard found on top of the content standard? What do the arrows show? What is the connection of these arrows from one point to another? For us to be able to find the connections, let's try to have the steps. So what are the steps to use this in using this technique? Number one, copy the content and performance standards and write them in the unit topic or unwrite the unit topic. Number two, unpack the transfer goal and performance task from the performance standard, then write it in the diagram. Number three, review the depth ed curriculum guide or the school curriculum map and take out competencies that are not directly aligned with the performance standard. These competencies may already have been taught in, your, in another grade level or may have been taught in your previous units. The number four, you classify the remaining unit competencies in terms of AMT learning goals and A, A and M for content and T for, for performance standard, then unpack when needed. Number five, unpack the EQ and EU and with M cluster of the competencies, establish a link with the content standard and performance task. Number six is cluster A with the competencies and establish the link with the content standard and performance task. And finally, for number seven, determine assessments for acquisition and making meaning, which are QA type for acquisition and WW type for making meaning. So let's try to do this step by step. Let's start with this example. If this example in, in grade eight, quarter three, these are the competencies that are required of the teachers to deliver to their students. The question there is, if I have only these competencies, will that give me a laminar or a turbulent flow in my design? Similarly, if I only use the depth ed curriculum guide quarter three for grade eight, if I will only make use of the old curriculum guide, 
I found out that I have 38 competencies, will that give me a laminar or a turbulent flow? So if you look at these scenarios, either of the two can actually produce turbulent flow. Even if you use only the MELCs or the DepEd curriculum guide. So it's not about which document you are using. It's about how you use these documents to be able to unpack important competencies in relation to the standards for you to be able to produce a laminar flow. Is that clear? Okay, good. Let's proceed to step number one. Step number one is you copy the content and performance standards and write the unit topic. It's very simple. You're just going to copy the content and the performance standards from the curriculum guide. For, for English, you can always go back to the old curriculum guide and copy the content and the performance standards. While other subject areas whose content and performance standards are already found in the MELCs, you can actually use these standards in the MELC already. Okay? So how do we do that? We copy them here in the diagram. So after we copy the standards in our diagram, what do we do next? We are going to unpack further. So what is step number two? We are going to unpack the transfer goal and the performance task from the performance standard. Then we are going to write our unpacked documents into our unpacking diagram. So if you look at this example, step number two is about unpacking the transfer goal. Why do we start with transfer goal? Why not, why not start with content standards? Because again, what was the goal uh, according to the MELCs document? For us, to, for us to identify the most essential learning competencies in connection to the standards, we are going to connect them to the performance standard. And this transfer goal can only be found in the performance standard. So from there, we unpack the transfer goal and our performance task from the performance standard. And in our previous insets in PAC, you learned that unpacking the, the transfer goal and performance task follow certain processes or follow certain patterns. In this example, as what you see on the screen, English teachers, this is grade eight, quarter three. And as what you see, the unpacking follows steps. What is step number one? First, you need to identify from the performance standard, the big idea. And the big idea there is represented by the main task that is required of the students to transfer to real life. And that is persuasive speech. Then after that, proceed to step number two. What is step number two? Step number two is to formulate transfer goal. And that transfer goal, how do we formulate that? There is a process of doing that. Use the highest form of the verb found in the performance standard to determine the kind of task and connect that task to real life situations. In this example, it is important that we remember the task should be connected to real life situations because when we connect it, we can actually let students find meaning to what they are doing. And finally, after identifying or formulating the transfer goal, we can actually unpack further by designing our performance tasks, which can be, um, which can be unpacked using the GRASP method. So in this example of unpacking, we can copy these important words from the, the unpacked documents. We can copy the important words into our diagram. So this will only, this will only contain the most important phrases that you did in the unpacking and, and transfer it to the unpacking diagram. Okay, so this is the bird's eye view whether or not the elements are actually connected. So the next step in this unpacking process is to determine which competencies from the curriculum guide 
and or the milks are directly related to the unpacked performance task. So how do we do that? What techniques can we follow as English teachers to determine every important connections or alignment among these learning competencies? So we can use step number three. What is step number three? Step number three is we review the DepEd curriculum guide or the school curriculum map and take out, again, take out competencies that are not directly aligned with performance standards. These competencies are, may already have been taught or may, may be taught in another grade or unit. So in this example, there are X marks and these X marks suggest that these competencies can be eliminated so that you can prioritize those competencies that are directly connected to the standards, particularly the performance standard. What are these sample competencies that are eliminated? Number one, determine the target audience of a material viewed. Explain the meaning of words through structural analysis. Now, since the performance task is more of delivering persuasive speech, then perhaps these competencies are no longer uh, or no longer helpful. What about these examples? We can eliminate from the list here these competencies, like explain how the elements specific to a genre contribute to the theme of a particular literary selection, or arrive at meanings through context clues. And just like these competencies, we still have other more competencies. So again, we take out these competencies because we just want and like. Ah, okay, uh, okay I'll, I'll delete this because I want to reduce. No, that is not our target. That's not our main goal. We eliminate these competencies because we find that these competencies are not directly connected to the performance standards. Therefore, I can give prioritization to other learning competencies. So given this eliminating process, from 38 competencies, I now have 31 core competencies. So what will I do with the 31 remaining competencies? So that is step number four. Step number four is I classify these rem remaining competencies into AMT learning goals. I classify which competencies are for acquisition, which competencies are for making meaning, and which competencies are for transfer. And in your screen right now, it gives you an example that these competencies are classified into A and M. And you notice that there are more competencies found in M rather than in A. So what are our criteria in determining whether these competencies fall under A, M, or T? This diagram was given to the teachers in the previous insets. This gives the verbs that are used to determine whether the competencies fall under A, M, or T. And if we use this further, we can actually see that the classification are guided very well. By looking at the verbs, we can determine whether these competencies are under A, M, or T. So after clustering or classifying them under A, M, T, what are we going to, to do after? We're going to put them in our diagram. So under acquisition, you're going to list those A competencies. And under making meaning, you're going to make connections of those competencies for you to be able to formulate your enduring understanding and your essential question. And that is found in step number five and step number six. Now the question here is, are we done after completing the diagram? Can we tell that this process ensures alignment and a laminar flow already? The answer to that is not yet because we still have step number seven. So what is step number seven? Step number seven is determining assessments for A. And that is the QA type and M for WW type. So in this example, 
we can think among the list of um, acquisition competencies that teachers can give vocabulary and persuasive techniques test under QA because of those list of competencies. On the other hand, looking at the WW, the essential question and the, the enduring understanding and the competencies that support the making meaning, we can actually give assessments that allow students to make arguments or analysis on current issues. So with this diagram, we can already determine whether our design is a laminar or a turbulent flow. What about you teachers? Is this a laminar or a turbulent flow? Okay, very good. So this looks now at a laminar flow. So what about in comparison to this? If you're going to compare the unpacking diagram, the completed unpacking diagram, is this example, the one you see on screen now, does it follow a laminar or a tur turbulent flow? Okay, it follows a turbulent flow. So that ends our technique A. Let's proceed now to, to our technique B. What is technique B? It's about identifying the power and the supporting competencies and clustering them. So in our previous insets, we learn these power standards or power competencies. So what do you mean by power standards or power competencies? First, there's a focus for teachers on what to teach. There's a higher level of learning, a prioritization of the academic standards, and it provides purpose or reason for learning a specific competency. We can see this diagram or this picture here wherein the association of the power competencies and the supporting competencies is actually found in this fence. If you look at this, the supporting competencies are the horizontal lines and the power competencies are the vertical lines that support each other. And in, in this example, we can actually make use of that association into our different subjects. So in this example, for the different subjects, we can actually determine which of these are power competencies if we identify which of the, these competencies give purpose or gives purpose to the power competency. For example, in English, do we explain structure of effective persuasive speech for us to identify types of models? Or is it the other way around? Do we identify types of models for us to explain structure of effective persuasive speech? So we can actually determine these power competencies and supporting competencies if we can answer that question, which of these competencies actually um, gives the purpose of that competency. So in this example, we can actually do steps. No, There are steps for us to follow, for us to be able to use the power competencies. So what are these steps? Number one, identify power and supporting competencies using the real from core set of competencies. Number two, make clusters of power and supporting competencies Number three, use sequence clusters of with the last related to the performance task. And number four is you set the budget of time for teaching and, and for teaching the clusters. So let's try to go back to our real method. Using the real, let's begin with the first criterion, the R. What do you mean by R? It's readiness. So we learned this in our previous insets, that readiness answers the question. Does this standard contain prerequisite content or skills necessary for the next unit or next study or next grade level? An example to that is provide appropriate and critical feedback reaction to specific context or situation. Is this competency helpful for the next grade level? Let's go to the next criterion, which is endurance. So again, does this standard have value beyond a single test and so on? So for example, analyze literature as means of connecting to the world. When you teach students to analyze, can students use this competency in the future? Will they be able to use the skill when, you, when they learn this in your English classes into their lives in the future? So that is endurance. Third is assessment. 
So assessment is simple. If the competency is used by agencies or schools that are producing standardized tests or assessments. So for example of that is determine tone, mood, technique, and purpose of the author. As English teacher, we learn that this competency is one of the most famous competencies included in national and international standardized tests. And last is the leverage. In the leverage, in English Milk's briefer, you can also find there that aside from endurance, another criterion that's used by the curriculum developers is actually to relate the competency to other subject areas. And that is that is called leverage. When the standard is connected to other subject areas or when the competency has connection to other subject areas. Example to that, if provide appropriate and critical feedback or reaction to specific context or situation. If you look at this competency, this competency, although only taught in English, but the competency is actually used in the subject areas. For example, in the uh, investigatory project of science, the social studies uh, performance task, and also other subjects. So given this method, how are we going to use that to unpack those competencies? So using the technique D, we are going to go back to our list of competencies and determine which of those competencies in the curriculum guide or and in the MELCs actually follow the real method. So if you look at this example, it's easy for you to determine because each criteria criterion is already represented by a check mark or an X mark. So those with X marks cannot qualify as power competencies. Therefore, they are just sub or supporting competencies. But this competency that has all check marks, these are surely called the power competencies. An example to that is determine key ideas, tone, and purpose of the author. And so we have other examples in the next slides. Okay, you can see this in the copy that you can download from the PAC website. So given this, what am, I to, what, am I, what am I asked to do as English teacher? After you identify the power and supporting competencies, you are going to plot them and arrange them using this clustering and budgeting of time of the unit power and supporting competencies. So you can just write here the clustered numbers and the number of days they are actually delivered and you can write on the second column the power competencies and also the supporting competencies in the third column. If you look at this example, these competencies ensure alignment because you can already see in one at one glance rather that these sub competencies are the required competencies that teachers may need when they teach them in the actual implementation. In short, when we when we unpack in our curriculum map, we might, by, we might be looking at the power competencies and few su sub-competencies, but in the actual implementation in our classrooms, we may go back to the sub and the supporting competencies in implementing the lessons and the activities for, for the students to, be com to completely achieve the power competency. So this is an example of how we can cluster the competencies in grade 8 English for quarter three. So after we cluster, we have found out that there are six clusters and there are 31 core competencies, a combination of the power and supporting competencies. Now the question there is, given this pandemic and the number of days that's allotted for me to deliver the curriculum, do I, have, do I have enough time to teach all the six clusters with the 31 core competencies? So if not, if it's not, if it's not enough, then can I still reduce the number of core competencies after clustering them? The answer is yes. You can reduce using the techniques that were mentioned earlier. So what are these? This is about eliminating, for example, can I eliminate compose an informative essay? Yes, I can already eliminate that, 
because students in grade 8, if we base it on our performance task, students will now deliver persuasive speeches, prepare and deliver persuasive speeches. Therefore, students will no longer write an informative essay. So that can be eliminated because it has no direct connection anymore to our performance task. So by eliminating that, we make the 31 core competencies into 27 core competencies. The question there is, can I still reduce? The answer is yes. I can reduce and make them into five or few clusters by merging and rephrasing. So we learn in our unpacking techniques in MELKS that merging and rephrasing allow the teachers to actually combine competencies that show the same skills or content and they can actually be rephrased into more specific competencies. So in this example, you see that these competencies here that are crushed out are actually fused or merged into the main competency left. Okay? So we have another example here. They are merged and rephrased. For example, these competencies, these supporting competencies, these three that are eliminated are actually merged into one, which is use appropriate documentation. And this one is actually merged and rephrased into show respect for intellectual property rights by acknowledging citations made in an informative essay. So after doing the merging and the rephrasing, what happened now to the number of competencies left? So from the 38 to 31 to 27, I now have 22 core competencies left. The question there is, if I still need, or if I still have, um, if I don't have enough time to deliver the competencies, can I still reduce this? Again, the purpose of reducing this number of competencies is not about you want to reduce it because that's what you like. You just want to deliver few competencies. But the purpose of this is actually to prioritize which competencies have directly connection or has as a direct connection rather to the standards, particularly the performance standard or the performance task. So can I still reduce? Yes, I can still reduce the 22 core competencies by applying more examples or applying more techniques like merging and rephrasing to some other clusters that I found that are no longer connected to the performance task. And I can delete entirely this competency that says show respect for intellectual property rights by acknowledging citations. Why can, I, why can I eliminate this? Because students are no longer composing. Therefore, you, you don't anymore check further these competencies because what you are looking at is actually the transfer of learning, which is the performance task of grade 8, quarter 3. And that is delivering, per, uh, delivering persuasive speeches. So from that, I have now 20, 20 core competencies and I only have four clusters left. So there are four power competencies and the, the 20 other um, competencies. So from the list now, the final list that I have, I can write them into the competencies column in the curriculum map. So we're done with part one and part two. We proceed to part three now. And what is part three? Part three is about subject teachers putting in their own creative ideas by, uh, by designing assessments and activities and by looking for resources that are directly aligned to the competencies and the standards. So how are we going to supply these materials or these elements in step number three? We are going to use this mapping assessment and activities. So if you look at this mapping, it contains different power and supporting competencies and the assessment that the teacher designs and also what materials are used by the teacher for the teacher to be ready in terms of its implementation. So if you look at under this column, if you look at these materials, it's divided into two, the offline and the online. So why do we have offline and online? 
in the new normal, many schools are adopting the full online delivery or the blended learning. So if teachers will have this map, teachers will be guided whether my assessment or my activity will require an offline material or will require an online material. Let's have this example I made from uh, this uh, LMs in the PAAC. By the way, you can download the LMs as well in the PAAC portal. So in this example, let's, let's use the first competency. Identify the four notable liter literary genres contributed by Southeast Asian writers. If I look at the sample in grade eight, quarter three, I can find or I can, I can find in the offline resources in the LM on pages 12 to 13 that I can give the activity entitled Tank Check using the worksheet provided there. For me to be able to do that, I can use the LM. So this is an example. I can use the LM to deliver the competency to the students and ask them to answer this worksheet. Okay, so this is an offline. For an online, I can, for example, use the links here and I can write the links into the map for me to be guided so that when I give this to the students, uh, this will form as their guide where to go to when the web links are already provided. So these are examples of activities that are aligned directly to the competency which can be taken from the learning modules in the PAAC. So this is another example. Actually, you can browse these examples in the LMs found in the, L in the PAC portals. So aside from, aside from completing the map, we can also find here in the, in the curriculum map that it's not just about completing the elements in the map. It's also about ensuring that all the elements we find in this map assessment that these elements are connected and they show alignment. So you can have the horizontal alignment, which suggests connections from the competencies down to the institutional core values. And we have this vertical alignment that ensures these competencies that you selected or that you prioritize actually show connections or progressions that will help students develop the power competencies. Is that clear? Okay, good. So after completing all of this, we can now have all of these data put together into our diary curriculum map. So in this diary curriculum map, you can see all the elements that we discussed earlier are already placed and they are already labeled they are already coded for the teachers to be guided and for the teachers to see in the bird's eye view of the curriculum map that the codes corresponds to the alignment as well. So for example, we have here D.1. So the assessment of D.1 is D.1 under assessments, D.1 under activities, and so on and so forth. So that is not just about completing the map. It's also about... What is our target? It's about alignment of these elements. And this alignment is supported by the PAC certification assessment instrument under the standards of compliance for curriculum and instruction. So if you see, it gives premium to the alignment of the elements found in the curriculum map. So how are we going to use the curriculum map into our budgeting of time? So this next example is actually a calendar that shows how we can budget all the activities that are found and all the assessments that are found in our curriculum app. If you see English teachers in our calendar, you can specify actually whether it's done online or done offline. Then the teachers can give this calendar on a weekly basis, not the entire quarter. Okay, so the weekly basis calendar will serve as the guide of the students. So you can call it the student's guide for the students to see what are expected of them to do for the entire week. 
So this this calendar or this budgeting of time calendar will actually help teachers find out as well whether the activities and the assessment still support the competencies that are unpacked in the in the previous slides that are placed in the curriculum map because you can see here the direction of your activities whether the students are prepared to perform the performance task or whether the students are directed towards the achievement of the performance center that is the beauty of this calendar so in summary what have we discussed in the previous slides what did we do in the previous slides english teachers so in summary if we go back to this if we go back to our previous slides we can actually see these three documents that are placed in your screen right now we can actually see that for us schools in the ESC or the private schools, participate in private schools, we can actually prepare the school curriculum of school year 2020-2021 if we prepare our curriculum map that is based on these documents. What is the first one? First, we have the DepEd Subject Curriculum Guide. This is the 2016 version. We also take it from the depth and melt matrix, and we also made use, if we are part of the ESC private school or participate in private schools, we also use the document from the PAC certification assessment instrument to look at the guidelines on how to make an effective and correct curriculum map. So if these are the documents needed, are we ensured that we can prepare our curriculum and deliver the curriculum despite this pandemic? The answer to that is yes. And aside from, aside from making the curriculum map, it also tells us and reminds us that the main goal of this process is not just to complete the map because it's required by the NPAC, but it's actually for our benefit as English teachers or teachers in the Philippines in general, it is our benefit to see if what we are teaching is still connected to what the standards require. And with that, we can say at the end of the day that we answer the goal of the K-12 curriculum, which is to teach enduring skills, to teach students enduring skills for work and life in the 21st century. And furthermore, what did we do for us to ensure that we are developing endurance or the transfer of learning to real life? We follow the steps in unpacking the milks, which you see on screen, and we also see the, we also use rather the streamlining process or techniques, which are technique, technique A for alignment of content standards to the performance standards, competencies to the performance standards, and also aligning or identifying the power and the supporting competencies for us to be able to cluster, merge, rephrase in prioritizing the competencies. So if we do all of this, can we now answer our core or essential question or the central question earlier? Can the ESC participate in schools prepare their school curriculum for this school year? Can I be ready to start the school year if I follow this? The answer is yes. So I want to leave you with this. Never give up. Today is hard. Tomorrow will be worse. And the day after tomorrow will be sunshine. That is a reminder for all of us from Jackman. So once again, thank you very much, everyone, for listening or for tuning in. I hope that this makes sense now because PAC is hosting this webinar to clarify all things and to be able to understand how are we how can we deliver the K-12 curriculum despite this pandemic. Thank you. Miss Mayu, you're on your mute. Miss Mayi, naka mute po kayo.
Thank you very much, Sir Ryan. Okay, uh, I know we uh, have very limited time now, but I guess we can still have a few questions. Uh, there's a question here that says, isn't it that in our insets, we are taught that we can add competencies to scaffold learning, but we cannot omit some of the competencies? Yes, that's, yes, that's true. We can also add competencies in the curriculum guide. And um, these competencies that we will add will actually help us um, connect further the competencies to the standards, to the content and performance standards. But before in our inset, it's actually mentioned that if, if, if there was actually a question if can, we cannot omit or can we omit competencies? The answer to that actually is yes, we can do that so long as these competencies that we omit are actually no longer directly connected to the standards. And that is done only temporarily. Huh? I'm saying temporarily because we are in this pandemic. So this is actually not done in, in, in all the things that we do every school year, for example. You cannot just eliminate, you cannot just delete a competency because you want to. You know, this process was introduced to you because we are running out of time and our teaching time is limited. Therefore, we are actually looking for the main connections and by, by you know, sifting all of these competencies, you know, limiting all of these competencies to the most important only because we have limited time. And that's the premise of this webinar. Thank, again, thank you very much, Sir Ryan, for your sharing. And thank you very much to our viewers. We hope that you have learned something valuable from our webinar today. Thank and you also. also. Yes. And let me also thank the people behind this webinar. Our Executive Director, Ms. Doris Ferrer, our TDA Officer, Ms. Presley Labau, our IT and IM and Data Privacy Officer, Mr. Butcher Barola, and our IT staffs, Sir Allen and Terrence, and Ms. Rachel, and the PAC National Secretariat. Again, thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Ms. Mary, can I also thank? Okay, yes. People. Yes, sir. Thank you to PAC for this opportunity, to Mom Doris, to Doc Mike, to all the people in the PAC, Ms. Mayi, and also Ms. Pressy. And thank you to all the teachers who are watching right now, especially to the teachers in SBCC and Cebu, St. Ben, and all the teachers in LaSalle Academy who are watching. God bless everyone. Thank you.